Melanie is assistant professor in neurology, but she's also done phenomenal research on consciousness. Her H factor impact factor for her publications is better than most of the faculty and most of the chairs in the departments at this university. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have her here because she's also a delightful person as a colleague. So when she talks about the ability for neurology and nursery to work together on problems of health and disease, this is exactly what we want to do in Grand Rounds. Pleasure having you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. So I talked today mostly about clinical data and hopefully you're gonna find it interesting and all clinically relevant. Um, basically, I'm gonna have a talk in two different um, you know, parts. The first part, um, I'm going to talk, talk to you about progress we have made over the last decade um, in uh, new markers, new techniques to assess the presence of consciousness in the patient that cannot respond. And uh, the second part, I'm actually going to kind of link this with progress we have made and also something that I know for some time and some progress that is being made about insights about what parts of the brain are more important for consciousness. And I'll end up with also some perspective. Okay. So assessing consciousness regarding, regardless of responsiveness. So, you know, at the bedside, clinically, we assess you know, consciousness by like response to command mostly, right? And um, we kind of know already if we define consciousness here as we define it scientifically as subjective experience, if this consciousness is something I'm seeing, hearing, feeling, thinking something, you know, from myself, versus of consciousness there is nothing at all. If we define consciousness like this, we already know there are some dissociations that can be present in all of us. For example, when we dream of night, we can have vivid dreams and we don't respond at all, yeah? So that can seem philosophical, but actually over the last, say, two decades, there has been uh, a, a number of studies that have shown that actually it has also clinical relevance. One of the first things I did in my scientific career when I was a medical student, you know, was actually to design a task that I thought would never work, you know, but design a task for asking patients to actually respond to comment through neural imaging rather than by moving. Yeah. And so it actually works very well. And you and I, if I put you in a functional MRI scanner and I ask you, imagine playing tennis, I'll see your motor areas light up. Imagine moving around your home, you'll have always a spatial net network light up. But I thought it would never work in patients. Why? You know, maybe we'll pick up like one one locked in once in a while. Yeah. But actually, to our surprise, and I, I actually was quite shocked by it, it, it works often, more often than you think. And we found in repeated studies, including New England studies, that about 15 to 20 percent of patients caught in the vegetative state, so no signs of responsiveness at all when you examine them. Actually, they do the task, so they understood the command, and they do it for you because they, they show this specific brain activations just when you ask them. And not only is true for, you know, chronic settings, but also there are new studies like Jan Klassen in the New England, showing that it's also the case in the intensive care. Even if patients have their eyes closed and they don't respond to command, there is actually covered consciousness that are there with EEG, you know, to imagine opening your hands and, and patients do it. And that has relevance because, as we know, there's a lot of uh, withdrawal of care in the ICU. And, you know, 80% of ICU deaths are uh, due to withdrawal of care, so that's an important information to know also for the families. So that's, you know, something that is now accepted as a progress in the field. And when we have a new technique assessing response to command through neuroimaging or EEG um, to find patients who actually are covered in conscious. But to me, it was not enough because, okay, we find 15% of them that do it when you ask them and you find a response to command. But what about the 85% others? Maybe they just, you know, didn't want to do it. Maybe they thought it was silly to ask, imagine playing tennis, you know? And so there are no reasons to, to think that these patients that do not respond to comment, even with neuroimaging, are conscious. So we moved on to actually design new markers, you know, uh, that do not require um, patients to respond to anything, to, to basically look at markers of brain activity for detecting consciousness. 
And that's actually inspired by a theory called integ integrated information theory, which we work here with Giulio Tononi, you know, and Marcelo Massimini. We actually did different experiments where we wanted to look at two different uh, yeah, markets. Yeah, yeah, right here. Brain activity. One is uh, how the brain is connected and also the differentiation of brain activity with a prediction that you actually need both integration and differentiation to be conscious. If you have no integration, then actually it's going to be like small modules. Uh, but if you have no differentiation, it's not going to be working neither. And so what you do, basically, you stimulate the brain with transcranial magnetic stimulation and you record the response with EG. And the prediction is that only when you're conscious, you're going to have a complex response with different brain areas doing different things. Yeah. And if you're unconscious, it's going to be small or big, but very simple. So we tested this marker over like 10 years when I was in Liège in Belgium and also with Milan here. So the first studies were done in Madison, Wisconsin during sleep. And the, what, the results are very clear. If you're conscious, like you're awake, you see this very complex brain activity, different brain areas doing different things for several hundred milliseconds. If you're unconscious, if you stimulate small or high intensity, you always get this, this kind of very small, uh, sorry, stereotype slow wave. Yeah? So conscious, complex, unconscious, simple. Um, and we move down to also look at other conditions like REM sleep, where you know you wake up people and they tell you, oh, I was dreaming. There, the response is complex. It's complex again. Anesthesia studies, midazolam, propofol, xenin. When you see when 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 subjects are conscious and awake, you know the response is complex. And anesthesia, it's always very simple. And you see this directly on the screen. It's a very high signal to ratio. It really works. Interestingly, under ketamine. Uh, ketamine alone, we've done that in Belgium. Uh, the response was complex, but uh, subjects, when they woke up, they actually told us they were there. So, again, if you're unconscious, the response is simple. If you're conscious, responsive or not, the response is complex. So, it really works. And so, what we try to do to move to closer to clinical application is to try to really summarize this complexity in a number. It's called Perturbable Complexity Index. And we validated this. A number as try to find you know if there's a difference in distribution between a lot of different situations where you are conscious so REM sleep ketamine wakefulness importantly patients with brain damage and then all the situations where you're unconscious and you can see here in this, these dots the colored dots are the maximum of complexity for the brain of the different subjects and so it, we, we found that you can actually draw a line you know at a given number a threshold like 0.31 but uh, where you actually have a 100% separation between conscious and unconscious states. This is the only measure that works like that. Typically, all the other measures we know are 70% accuracy. This is 100%. Okay, So that's progress because now we have actually a strong marker uh, to try to infer the presence of covert consciousness without requiring a response to comment from the patient, but now going to patients that cannot respond to you. Right? So we did some studies in patients both called minimally conscious states where they can communicate or the ones that are completely unresponsive in vegetative state. And what we serve is actually the patients that give you an intelligent response to command, even if they cannot communicate, the, this index tells you that 95% chance to be conscious. But importantly, in the patients that are completely unresponsive, and these are mostly chronic patients here, we find different types of responses in about 20% of the cases here, you find this complex response indicative of likely covert consciousness. It's a little higher than when we got with the imagine playing tennis, but they are still confirming these response here in purple that there is covert consciousness in this patient population as well. And then in the other cases, you actually find that that complexity is low. The response can be completely flat or it can be sleep like. Uh, but about 80% of them actually show this low complexity response. Not only this has relevance in our view to detect patients who are covertly conscious, but also um, it can uh, potentially have you know, the management for these patients, what you try to deal with them. Potentially, we have to continue to test this, but the patients that have a complexity of zero, no response at all, wherever you stimulate with TMS, they never recovered. The, if you find a sleep like response in the brain, then it means that some connectivity is there. Potentially, you could actually have uh, these patients with neuromodulation. And then for the patients that are covertly conscious, not only they have much higher chances to recover as well, but also we might want to really target them with 
personalized brain computer interface. So just to show you, you know, some advances that, you know, um, we've seen over the last few years, and I've been lucky, involved, uh, lucky to be involved in both of them, uh, but really uh, advancing our understanding of what matters for consciousness in the brain, but also helping to potentially stratify these patients with disorders of consciousness. So I wanted to show you that also because, you know, we're uh, starting this collaboration in the ICU here to try to bring these tools a more closer to the bedside. But I'll talk a little bit about that in the perspective. Um, but also showing you that there is some progress in cautionary science that has clinical relevance. And the second part is also like how clinical studies that we like data that we see all the time in neurology and neurosurgery also have uh, relevance to understand the links between consciousness and the brain. Um, and so, um, they, you know, if you, as we talk about consciousness for a subjective experience, again, it may sound a little philosophical, but since 20 years, there has been a practical agenda that has been defined in neuroscience to study uh, the link between consciousness and the brain is called the neural policy of consciousness. And basically what you do is practically, you search for the minimum neuronal mechanisms job is sufficient for any one conscious perception. And, and here that's where the studies with lesion and, and stimulation actually have relevance because not only it should be specific for every conscious perception, there should be an NCC. If you induce it, so you stimulate the brain, you should induce it. If you inactivate that, uh, NCC, say by lesioning it, you should actually also eliminate it. So basically we have this kind of perturbation on agenda inducing, inactivating different parts of the brain, and then find for the neural substrate. I call it neural substrate because it's beyond correlation. We really want causal evidence here. Yeah? And then, you know, I mean, the brain is vast, you can do anything, right? So I'm not going to focus on the whole brain, and I'm going to focus on the contrast that is actually a particular relevance for neuroscience and for, you know, explaining, uh, kind of finding a scientific explanation for what actually makes a difference for consciousness. And that's the contrast between basically the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain. The main point of this slide is show you that, remind you, I mean, you all know this, but prefrontal cortex is big. It's like a fourth of the cortical sheet, yeah? And so for this reason, and also it's like highly complex, highly connected to everything, right? For this reason, it is actually remarkable how unremarkable patients with large prefrontal lesion actually uh, seem to be. Uh, so there are some very classical, you know, neurosurgical cases, uh, say a lot in the 40s. So that's a classical patient from Brickner, who had a whole book about this, who actually was described as bilateral resection of the whole prefrontal cortex, except for Broca aria and aria six. And this is like the history shows in the book, yeah? And this patient, despite this bilateral prefrontal cortex resection, very large, um, actually one day was able to tour uh, the Neurological Institute of New York in a party of five. Three of them were neurologists and nobody noticed anything after the attention was pointed to him after another. Uh, an hour, yeah, so basically this patient, he had problem, yeah, behavioral problem, he was disinhibited, but clearly not unconscious, right? So if you see how prefrontal cortex is big and complex, that's quite, that's quite striking clinical data, suggesting that you don't need a prefrontal cortex to be conscious. Uh, now, also some studies that were done in macaques, because there was a lot of uh, controversy at that point about what is the role of the prefrontal cortex at all. Um, and basically, yes, they found some problems like the monkeys were stealing, aggressive, et cetera, but clearly they were conscious. They were uh, stealing their food you know, from their friends or they were able to, to solve complex tasks that in humans we know we need to be conscious for that. So these kind of legion studies are very strong because it suggests to you that even if you, know, you have complete resection of prefrontal cortex bilaterally, uh, you, you don't cause unconsciousness. And it's in contrast with lesions actually from posterior a part of the brain. So this is a paper backhand showing that actually if you have lesions of corpus callosum, if you read in the text, it's the posterior part of corpus callosum and the surrounding white matter. If you have traumatic brain uh, lesions in, in that area, you have 214 time chances to never recover from coma compared to seven in the brain cell. 
Yeah, so that's very strong as a contrast, and the prefrontal cortex was not informative. There are some newer studies also now uh, coming up with uh, anoxic brain injury, taking into account the confluence of withdrawal of care, showing that actually if you compare different models, models with occipital and or parietal regions only, with looking at injury in these areas, actually better predictors for not recovering than the whole brain. And also, it's not only about being conscious or not as a state, it's also if you look at different parts of the brain that actually cause lots of different specific contents of consciousness. And in that realm, we have the universe of agnosia. So, yeah, so prosopagnosia, for example, is an inability to recognize faces. And that's actually lesions in the fusiform uh, gyro suspicion on the right side. Yeah? So basically, if you look at all these different types of agnosias, you have many, you know, sensory agnosia, visual agnosias of different types. Uh, if you map them, you actually find that, uh, again, the majority of them are in uh, the back of the brain. There's only one agnosia I know about in inferior frontal cortex, which is more like not recognizing spatial emotions. But if you look at lesions that create uh, contents of uh, loss of conscious consciousness, you'll find them in the back of the brain. Um, there's some actually progress that is also being made. We're kind of discovering new agnosias now with the progress of neuroimaging and, and assessments. For example, we have now some cases described of lesions in the pecunis, where patients have actually uh, strange uh, problems like inability to discriminate their own face, you know, or like a loss of feeling of control over their actions, yeah. And so if you map actually these self-related disorders, they come a lot from posterior neural cortex. So we are discovering more and more of these and, uh, you know, looking at neurosurgical outcomes, you might also find more of this. But basically, if we find lesions that have consequences on the context of consciousness, they're working in the back of the brain. It's not, of course, that if you have lesions in prefrontal cortex, you don't have consequences. There's, a, there's this very nice continuum paper uh, from 2018 uh, that describes different types of frontal syndromes. But basically what you get is you have impaired task setting or monitoring, emotional regulation for orbital frontal cortex, some metacognition or uh, impaired initiation of spontaneous actions. But these are, if you notice, more like action-related disorders, not so much about the corpus of consciousness per se. Yeah, it's thought to be that it's a different kind of architecture in the front with this loops with the basal ganglia that are in, 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 um, responsible there. So basically, what I brushed you here <laughs> with a mostly clinical, you know, studies, right? Where uh, there's a striking contrast, you know, uh, in how different parts of the brain can actually predict both if you're conscious or not, but also if you're gonna have kind of the full repertoire of, of some loss of the concept of consciousness. And in lesions in the front, there are more for task-related contents, but not so much for experience per se. And then uh, kind of, I wanted to put these lesion studies in parallel with some kind of data that you're also very familiar with and more and more familiar for the residents. Uh, I guess this is, uh, these uh, data we get from direct electrical stimulation of the cerebral cortex, okay? So we do that when we do bedside mapping, right? In epilepsy monitoring unit, and then also in the OR, Sometimes, yeah, awake mapping especially. Uh, but basically, if you look again, a uh, broad picture of the studies with direct electrical stimulation, you find a similar contrast. If you elicit, you know, activation in different parts of the posterior cortex, you can have different types of sensations like prestigia, an illusion of intention, some sounds, right? But actually the, the prefrontal cortex per se is experientially silent. You can have twitches, you know, movements, but typically you don't change the contents of consciousness. I'll go more into details with that. I thought it would be of interest to you. There are some new studies now, also in, in cohorts of patients, where, for example, this they show that if you stimulate these electrodes here in blue, you can actually have uh, hallucinations of rainbows, colors, yeah, in area V4. If you stimulate more laterally, you're actually going to have hallucinations of faces, so you kind of see the balloon become the face. Yeah, it's a very specific effect in different parts of the cortex. And then if you stimulate more posterior areas, you can have phosphine, so simple visual uh, perception. If you stimulate this area here on the, on the close to empty, on the lateral occipital cortex, you'll have motion. You can have out of body experiences on the right temporal parietal. You can have actually many different sorts of sensations, very specific by 
uh, by, by location, auditory hallucination for temporal lobe, et cetera. Yeah? And then again, we also have some new data about this kind of altered sense of self in the precunius. <laughs> there are some, especially in the anterior part of the precunius, which is behind the somatosensory cortex. There is this, uh, you can have this distortion of uh, the sense of body self. It's like the patient described, um, it's like I'm in the cockpit, but I, I'm not in control of my body. It's like I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still the pilot, I'm still there, but I can't control my body anymore. So it feels like it's not my body and things like this. Yeah? So with the refinement of kind of the questions we ask, the panels we have, we're finding more and more through these electrical stimulation studies about the, the, the different function of different parts of the brain. And again, there are many different concepts you can elicit from the back of the brain in the front. It's more rare. There are some actually studies, a recent study, for example, in the orbitofrontal cortex, and you see here responsive electrodes are more the posterior part, where you can have sensations, not surprisingly here, like smell and taste, but also sometimes somatosensory uh, or negative emotion experiences, like in this kind of posterior part. And then there's also some studies were looking more like in the anterior mid-singulate that uh, have reported reproducibly some kind of thought-like concepts, like intrusive thoughts or weird to persevere, yeah? So in, in these areas, you get a more the posterior part, you can actually have some feelings about emotions or like thought-like uh, uh, sensation. Um, and sometimes, rarely, you can have some complex hallucinations that can be elicited, but typically these are more from temporal lobe. So basically, if we summarize, uh, you know, and that is also a summary that has been done recently on a large cohort of patients, you see that for results of electrical stimulation, you have the same contrast that we actually uh, notice for lesion studies, where if you look at the response rate, yeah, for changing contrast of uh, experience, you have a stark contrast between the posterior cortex being very eloquent with a lot of different sensations that can be elicited by a perturbation of different areas, while the very front of the brain itself is silent. And so that's actually something that kind of we know clinically, but we need to understand also better, that, you know, to some degree, which parts to what, yeah? But also there's something really important to uh, understand here for neuroscience. Uh, that contrast, that large prefrontal lesions do not cause unconsciousness, and prefrontal cortex is big, yeah? But large posterior brain lesions actually do so. And this difference we have in the eloquence of the different parts of the brain um, as well. Yeah. So a summary and a little perspective too, you know, where we're trying to go also with this. Um, I hope I wasn't too long, but I hope not. Hope not fine. So basically what I tried to show you is, I think there's exciting progress in consciousness science. Yeah, we're moving from philosophy to data more and more. And also we have new markers that are now available uh, for detecting the presence of consciousness. Is there someone behind the stair in a way? Yeah? The presence of consciousness, even in patients who cannot communicate. Um, and actually these dissociations are much more frequent than we thought. I, I thought me as a medical student, it would be rare, but like it's 15 to 20% of patients, both in the chronic and acute state, yeah? And so we have a new index in particular that we think is very promising because it does not require the collaboration of the patient. Uh, the perturbation or complexity index is when you do TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation or UG. And so we started, you know, with Eric Trubula, Marine Darcy, and the rest of the ICU team to try to, we have IRB approval to try to really start to do some studies in the bedside in the ICU, discuss together how, you know, this could be potentially inserted in, in patient care. Uh, so we had, you know, a perspective like a drawing last year, also showing how it could be that you come with this basically TMS, the EEG recordings, and you directly at the bedside can assess local brain function, not only if the patient is conscious or not, but also like the function of different types of areas. So that was a drawing from last year, and then it's starting to happen. So we had our first patient in MGH, that we're trying to do this also in the ICU, so that was November, first patient in the ICU at MGH where they found that kind of same dissociation I explained about the patient had high complexity in a posterior brain areas, but like sleep-like activity uh, in the front. And so most likely this patient is converted conscious. He was not responding to command even with neuroimaging. And, um, and so this uh, is, is potentially something that is very relevant ethically for, you know, withdrawal of care decisions, but I think there's also a lot of potential for understanding local, you know, brain function 
in patients and see which parts of the brain we can actually try to neuromodulate. What about neuromodulation? Well, I wanted to mention some of that to you because I think it's very exciting. And I, you know, I wanted to share to you where we go with that too as well. So I mentioned to you, you know, if we summarize, we, we're, getting, we're getting better understanding. Also, there's a whole story about piecing with neuroimaging, but that's too long for today. Uh, but uh, if you look at lesions and electrical stimulation studies, which are much more causal than neuroimaging data, you find that contrast where posterior brain areas are the most predictive of being conscious and a large number of conscious contents. Of course, you have deficits, in, but of a different kind. Yeah, if you have proof of a, a context lesion is more task related. But there's this contrast for conscious that we can see there. As I mentioned to you, I think it's very exciting that through you know, the efforts of the whole neuroscience community, but we have a, a role to play there also as clinicians, which starts to have a better understanding of the links between consciousness and the brain, and also which networks are specialized in, in what kind of, of function. And, and to me, why it matters to know mechanisms better is actually because there's more and more progress in these neuromodulation techniques that could help us to enhance function in the networks that, uh, that need to be modulated or recover as well. And one technique I wanted to mention to you because I think this is really coming up as a small revolution or maybe big, but like it's actually really impressive. Um, it's just started to happen, but uh, that, that we have studies in humans right now, and we have it also in the lab right now. It's called temporal interference. And what, how it works is basically, unlike the, the classic direct, like transcranial electrical stimulation, you have beams of very, very high frequency, like 30 kilohertz, you know, that you actually don't feel on the skin, and they don't do much to the brain per se, uh, but you, you have two beams of, of, of this, for example, and they cross at a location that you target and it can be deep in the brain, and then they beat at an interference frequency. And that interference frequency actually can modulate brain function locally there. So what happens is that you actually now have this way to target wherever you want in the brain, including deep brain structures. So we have like a DARPA grant not to enhance deep, you know, <laughs> looking at insula and, and posterior cortex, but they, there are many, many other applications potentially for this. They just had the same team we work with, a nature neuroscience paper um, showing that you can actually, uh, validating that you can actually stimulate the function of the hippocampus with this tool, for example. So they had a caliber study where they looked at, you know, really like the, the biophysical uh, mechanisms. And as you see, these are like four electrodes on the skull. It's much less, you know, actually complicated than many devices we use. You have four electrodes like this and these beams of currents. And they showed actually that indeed, when you do this interference, you, in the absolute uh, current that the cortex is getting is more, but the interference, that modulation, is actually coming only in the hippocampus, not in the cortex. So you can actually stimulate deep brain areas without interfering with the function of, um, of the superficial ones. And also they showed that you can actually influence function with this. So by a particular combination of parameters, like one a uh, pair more than the other, they could, they could target in particular the an anterior hippocampus. And doing so, they were reducing the ball signal, but they could actually enhance memory in humans, like living humans. So that's actually very promising, of course, also for all the patients with epilepsy to modulate function. This is actually, now that we're, they're starting to work with a lot of teams, including us, yeah, but I think there's a lot of, of, of potential for clinical applications in all the patients we see. More to, more to do about this, but I just wanted to, to let you know this is happening. And also coming back to our patients in the intensive care, yeah? So imagine we have this patient, you know, with uh, preserved complexity in the parietal areas, okay? But then we have the sleep like responses in the front. Well, you know, my hope is that not, not so long from now, we might actually be able to come with some clinical trials, like in the patients where complexity is actually low in the front, I want to wake up these cortical areas, go, for example, stimulate the dorsal medial thalamus and have them to recover. Again, this is kind of in the near future, we'll see, uh, but the safety uh, data are already there for using humans, so maybe we'll talk more about this soon. And again, also epilepsy, there's a lot of uh, different groups thinking about doing this. Uh, so basically, this is kind of my summary for today. I wanted to share with you my excitement about the progress in consciousness research. Also how we as clinicians and neuroscientists, we can actually contribute to this and there's a lot more progress being done. 
but also how with our improved understanding of the mechanisms, we can also hope to improve patient care by targeting specific networks, depending on the clinical picture we have. Yeah, and try to, to improve outcomes. So that was it for today. This is all the teamwork over the years. And I'm very thankful also for, you know, all the help from Wendell for clinical studies and the NeuroIC team. And thank you for listening. Yeah. Oh, it's great. You mentioned that um, you said you were talking about PCI, that, that patients who have a higher PCI or more complexity of response to the stimulation have a better prognosis. That's what we see in the data. Yeah. So, but the data we had were a lot in the kind of subacute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we also see that the patients who respond to comment poverty, they, they do have a better prognosis. That was also in the New England. There's more studies to be done. Yeah. But that's kind of what the data we have right now is there. So these patients will be pulled from gain consciousness? So basically, if we define losses by being there, we have all reasons to think that their consciousness will be kind of respond. Yeah. But yes, they will actually have much more uh, chances to, to um, recover. Even patients that show kind of minimal signs, like just to respond to command. What is actually more apparent now in the studies that have been done is that it can take time. It can take months sometimes to recover for some of them. Yeah. So if you see someone covertly conscious, they are more likely, uh, they are much more likely to recover. It's not certain, but it's much more likely. But it's not necessarily that they're going to recover in the same week. Yeah, that's kind of what we do. Raises all sorts of ethical uh, issues. Yeah. yeah. Other um, question, what does the, does the PCI have to do with the BIS? So BIS is actually helping to not to uh, be accurate to predict consciousness and anesthesia. Yeah. We didn't actually, for kind of logical, logistical reasons, we didn't start anesthesia studies, you know, or anything like that. Yeah, with TMS, but in principle, this complexity index, you know, should do a much better job, especially if you follow the brain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, fantastic talk. Thank um, you. I had a huge smile on my face the entire time. Thank you. Um, second, I don't think we've met. Um, I'm Kip Ludwig. I'm research faculty within. Actually, about you. Um, also a former <laughs> NIH program director, we do research in neuromodulation, but I also led the neurotechnology portfolios. And so there's three things that occurred to me as I saw your talk. Uh, one is in terms of, are you familiar with Nico Schiff's work? Yeah, he was a friend. Yeah, so it, to me, it's interesting in that, so Nico Schiff has shown in a number of subjects that are in a, uh, a completely vegetative state by stimulating central uh, thalamus with the DBS electrodes right. that he can essentially uh, get to uh, minimally responsive or even better, but there's no biomarker. They're kind of doing a binary twiddling dials in thalamus, sure. and then they don't have the subtlety that you can provide in yeah. terms of um, uh, being able to almost close the loop, say, are we getting increases in network? Uh, he also just did a study in patients with TBI, yeah. kind of moderate TBI, right. and you can improve function and yeah. um, And similarly, there's a group who has shown this with vagus nerve stimulation as well, where they're just, again, kind of twiddling dials, yeah. and they don't have this, this much more elegant right. way of doing evoked potentials and looking at the complexity that might be a biomarker for closed loop. Right, and to me, having a biomarker like that could also help you really see the ones that would benefit from this neuromodulation exactly. longer and then further recall. Exactly. Um, and then second, in terms of EEG is a bit of a uh, lower signal to noise metric. You had mentioned that in terms of uh, uh, patients who were uh, completely unresponsive, that uh, roughly 15 to 20% could visualize and get an EEG response. I'm curious in terms of, do you think that is capturing all the ones or given that EEG for visualization tasks, um, you know, there's some people who are completely conscious who have difficulties creating in a visualization task differences in EEG. Yeah. Uh, would you consider the, the percentage that are, would actually be responsive if we had more sensitive techniques uh, would be higher? And if so, how much? Right, so that was my concern when, when we kind of created the Imagine Playing Tennis program. You need seven minutes of full attention to do it, you know? And it's complex, and so I thought actually it's, it was unlikely to work. It's even more striking that you see so many patients doing it. Functional MRI has a better signal to nose ratio, you know? But EG, you can also have like a shorter response, it's a little bit more sensitive. And actually, in institutions like MGH, they had a discussion with the IRB and they, they do this systematic in patients, they even bill for it and kind of share the results with the family of the two studies, not as big definite, but an indication that patients are likely conscious if families want to know. Yeah. 
Now, what I'm saying is like, okay, yeah, it's kind of more demanding. That's that's why we had the other index chip yeah, coming, the, the PCI. PCI doesn't require any collaboration. You could be dreaming and you, you cannot still be detected. But uh, at the end, you know, it's like 19% versus 15%. It does pick up some patients. Uh, like the case I showed you, the last case, it was not playing tennis or anything and had high complexity, uh, but they are both useful potentially to do. Yeah. Yeah. EG, it depends how you do it. With the TMS EG, is super high similar to right. the other ones. The other ones, if we were to employ it, that's also why we didn't start it yet. We, I would have to, I want my hands in there and see how it's done. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's where a, a TMS visual evoked section are much higher SNR than visually. Uh, imagine. Oh yeah, no, it's on the screen. You see, it's like black or white. This is there's nothing like it. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention, and this is unfortunately, um, there's huge controversy in the field right now about temporal interference or interferential stem. Um, and the reason being, and just so everybody's aware in terms of context here, um, interferential stem. This idea of doing two uh, two different frequencies that interfere with each other to get deep stimulation. Uh, you can get on a TENS unit at Walmart, and it's been around for 30, 40 years. So when the Ed Boyden paper came out, it didn't reference that this is a common um, technique that has been used for muscle stim and has large-scale meta-studies showing that it's, it's something that works in small animal models really well, but it's more difficult to get the beat frequencies to interact when you get to larger animal models and humans. So there's human studies showing they had difficulties doing the exact same thing that they date back to the 90s and 2000s. And it's interesting in that there's also been recent studies for non-invasive stem showing that because you do get some activation or inhibition of peripheral nerves, so 3,000 hertz actually will activate some nerves. That's another mistake in that paper, mm -hmm. depending on how much you turn it up to. It's not at the frequency that's completely uh, filtered by cells as is in that. Um, and if you can do it to yourself, you can put it at 3,000 hertz and turn it up, you will feel it. Mm -hmm. um, so the concern uh, that has come out recently for TACS is that a lot of things that we're assuming that were stimulating brain areas, mm -hmm. when they did lidocaine right under the electrodes, they found out that they were getting cranial nerve input from the brainstem that would activate cortex or hippocampus. So there's a confound of those studies that have to be addressed sure. in terms of are you potentially either um, activating or inhibiting um, cranial tonic cranial nerve input through sure. brainstem that go to hippocampus and cortex. I think one uh kind of argument against this kind of non-specific effect is especially that you can get these specific differences in function of, like that are different for different parts of the brain. So when we're, we're using it, for example, to target the retrospinial cortex as a localizer, we have a spatial navigation task. And specifically in one part, it does impair this and not memory or not language or this, right. this kind of specific, region specific effect, you know? Are, are starting to be seen. So if you do 10 hertz versus 135, you have different effects. Of course, we stay in the safety limits and all that, you know, approved in humans, and it's kind of different than stimulating the muscle. Yeah. Right. But I do feel, I, I, compared to, I'd say, TMS or other techniques I've seen, I do feel there's a lot of potential there. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, yeah. And I think it's well established, uh, even in the studies that did lidocaine, that you can get some specificity of brain stimulation, yeah. that it also comes along with substantial cranial nerve stimulation. All the patients will tell you, I yeah. feel it, that's input through cranial nerves that has yeah. broad implications on cortex. Um, I think for temporal interference or interferential stim, which is essentially what it's called back in the day, yeah. um, um, that they still need to do these studies with lidocaine to because right. you would expect differences in brain area depending on where you're stimulating where those cranial nerves go to. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, one of the points that's so very important is that the question of whether you're stimulating or inhibiting, and the answer may be exactly how much energy and exactly how it interferes. It absolutely is. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's an important confounder when everybody just says they're stimulating, they're often actually inhibiting. Yeah. So like 10 hertz in the hippocampus would have like memory enhancing effects. But if they use, I, I know it's um, <laughs> what they do now, 135, you actually impair memory in the pencil. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the dominant thoughts for GBS at 130 30 hertz now are you're more inhibiting uh, than activating and keeping uh, one-to-one -one entrainment at 130 hertz. Both of which have clinical implications and uh, potential benefit, especially in inhibiting seizures, for example. Uh, it's outstanding. Thank you, Melanie. It was delightful. Thank you. Great to have you. Thank you for having me.